chance to dedicate your oration on somebody as eminent as Professor M. G. Kinney. It is said that a life is measured by the legacy that one leaves behind and to this Professor Kinney stands very high. From a humble origin, he became the person who established the Department of Orthopedics in Madras Medical College when it was the Madras Providence and covering many southern states. But it is not the administrative post, but the far vision he had, because at a time when data collection was not considered to be important, he powered the idea of data maintenance. He emphasized on clinical research, and that is why his scientific papers and lectures made him a leader in this field. Naturally, there were many awards and honors in his name, which he got. And as Professor Mailwan and Nadrajan wrote in his obituary, we veritably stand on people like him on the shoulders. Let us be worthy of them. Now, if you look at his life, there are many important facets that made him great. And looking at that, I thought that I should talk today about what makes a person a leader in the profession. How can one achieve professional excellence rather on some orthopedic topic at all? Now you may ask, what does snakes and ladders have to do with professional excellence? Because we all think of this as a childhood board game where you throw the dice and you finish when you come at the mark. But on the way, you can have many ladders that take you up and many snakes that can bring you down. And if you look at it, it is just not a child's game. Because the origin of the game is, goes into ancient India, where it was actually told to the children as a method of teaching the law of karma, as a way of taking them to the ladder of salvation. Even today, in many parts of India, they are all played with the different names, Moksha Padam, Vaikunda Pali, Paramabhada Sopanam. It all means how do you reach the top? How do you attain salvation? And ingrained into this is the principle that there are many ladders of virtue which can take you up and there are many snakes of vice which can bring you down, crashing. Now in the original game of many hundreds of years ago, these were the squires of virtue, faith, reliability, generosity, knowledge, and asceticism. And as you can see, the squires of vice are much more probably showing that God gives you the possibility of snakes much more, more temptations in life than more ladders that he gives you. And it is in our ability to way go around it to attain professional excellence. Salman Rushdie in his book, Midnight Children Clearly Told, this particular game has morals. The eternal truth that for every ladder that you hope to climb, there is a snake waiting just around the corner. And for every snake, there is a ladder to compensate. And I think we should remember this as professionals because this is what is going to differentiate one over the other in the long professional life. I think when we all begin the profession, we are all like this at the start of a marathon. Everybody has high aims. Everybody has high ideals. Everybody wants to be number one. But unfortunately, there is only a few who are actually number one and who finish the marathon. Now, our association is fast growing. We are more than 10,000 members. And there are about 300 to 400 members, young people joining every year and majority of our members are less than 40 years. On the other hand, I am now 54 years old. I have more than 25 years of professional experience. And during this period, I have watched and learned from many people, see them go how high they go and maintain their position of leadership. We have also seen many people who go very fast up but come crashing down. And there are many people who wither away even in the middle. So this is just sharing my thoughts to the younger generation in the Indian Orthopedic Association. And if it helps somebody to clarify a few thoughts in their mind, I would have been very lucky. 
Now, how do we play the game of snake and ladder? Now, as we start the game, it is important that you should play at number six or five even before you start. And I think this can be equated with the training that you get before you start your profession. I think the two important ladders at this stage of life which will take you up much better than others is professional competence and skills. Very important that we give us that, uh, our best to them. Now, all these, if you see, there is an element of professional misjudgment or professional competence. Now, we may think of this as one non-union, but behind every non-union, there is months of suffering, lots of financial loss, a lot of pain, and many opportunities missed for the family. I know that there are many complications which have totally removed the son of the family from getting good education, or the daughter in the family getting married to the right person because medical complications can simply wipe away a family's wealth. So we have to be sure that we don't make medical mistakes because even in the United States of America, medical accidents remain the highest cause of death, much more than motor vehicle deaths or deaths from fall. And it is bound to be much more in our country. So apart from the disease factors and patient factors, it is the surgeon who tilts the balance in the ultimate outcome. And a young surgeon must concentrate a lot on training because even though poor results are bad news anywhere, it is a bigger bad news in India because 91% of patients are self-paying and for many families, it is in the situation of no work, no food. Now, as a young surgeon, you may ask me this question. You may challenge me, if we cannot operate before we attain expertise, how are we going to operate enough to gain the expertise? And what do you mean by the term hands-on training? So how do we get it if we cannot operate? Now I can challenge you back with the same question, will you be able to accept the same law when you climb into a plane and you say, let this pilot learn while he flies when I am inside the plane? If aviation industry works with the same principle and level of safety of medicine, then one thing that will not be there is the frequent flyer program. Because by the time anybody gets a blue card, he will be no more. So we really have to be sure that professional competence is something that we get first and that is going to be a very big ladder in our life. The second question here is, when we say the Hippocrates oath, I will use my power to help the sick to the best of my ability and judgment, then you can ask, from who am I going to get this, ability, this uh, judgment? And here comes the importance of mentorship. I think if during your post-graduation you do not have this chance, you should seek a time and a place where you will work with one of your role models so that your foundation becomes strong. The modern day medicine has many gadgets which can be extremely useful or extremely harmful if you are just a high tech surgeon without understanding the principles. And that is why you have the power of mentorship. If you work with a great person like Professor TKS, a great luck that I had, he always used to tell, never jump at a new technique because a fool is the new tool, is still a fool. And he always said, if you want to be a cutting edge surgeon, stay with the times, but you will leave a lot of blood and misery behind. But if you want to be a safe surgeon for your patient, be five years behind the times, you will be one of the good things. So I think if you have to build a ladder, be sure that you lean the ladder on a concrete wall based on good training and good teachers is something that you must go through. Now as you go up in life, I think the biggest snake that can catch you at this stage is impatience for success. Because impatience can cause wise people to do foolish things. Now, if you have to fly very high, and if you have to fly the highest, biggest plane, then you have to be ready to go through a long runway. If you are impatient for success, then you can get into lots of other problems. As you can see here, unwanted surgeries, unethical practice, and dicey financial relationships. When we look at big successes, we forget to look at how hard they have worked 
or how long they had to go up to this. Now when Sachin was asked about his effortless six, he said, yes, effortless, but it took me years of effort to get to the point of getting an effortless six. When A.R. Rahman was asked how long does it take for him to get an orchestra, he said twice the time that you think because I usually have to work day and night. When Narayanamurthy was asked how the Infosys became an overnight success, he said yes, it took us 25 years to be called as overnight success. So we look at the success, but we do not look at what actually gone into it. And here, one of the common mistakes that we do is not to differentiate between two concepts, leapfrogging in profession and shortcuts in profession. Leapfrogging is something what every successful individual does. He does not wait in the queue, but he just jumps over competition behind his peers, mainly because of his ability, his capacity for skills, and his capacity for hard work. But this is what every successful person does. But shortcuts is completely different. And it's also because of a wrong understanding of what is success. It is not the awards or the money that you get. And if you do that, it doesn't take too much time for you to come from front page to the fireplace. And here, you will lose your temptations, lose to temptations and shortcuts. And it's important that you have a conscience bearer with you. Now, our guest speaker today, Mr. Shukera, has also spoken to us once in Bombay. And the one big thing that I always learnt out of that, uh, something is very clear in my mind. He said it's difficult to define conscience, but whenever you are doubt, just think if your action will be approved by your mother. It is a golden rule for success and it will keep you on the right lane. I think one of the biggest plus points in my life has been that we have been in a joint family. Where I have to go and dine and take my dinner with my father and mother, and if I have done something wrong, it will really grudge me into something that which I cannot discuss with them is something that I can't afford to do. Now, if you escape this snake, the next ladders that are going to really take you high up is high aims and hard work that goes hand in hand. Each one is interdependent on the other. Now, we heard our guest speaker yesterday, Mr. Milka Singh, talk about this Chalta High attitude. As he was talking, I could understand only 50% of it because of the lack of knowledge of Hindi. But I could hear lots of claps. And one of the things that I was thinking is, how many people are going to go and then leave this Chalta High attitude and get back to the hours of work which Mr. Milka Singh said we should do. Because as a country, we are known for this attitude and also what is called the performance gap. The issue is not what we are doing <clears throat> because we celebrate very early, but what we are capable of doing, and here comes the huge gap. The previous Olympics game is a perfect example for this. The entire press and the whole country was going gaga with so much of celebration, so much of Arjun Award, so many things over because of which each time we get a medal. But if you really see, the other way of seeing is actually, could we have done better? And the way that we could have seen is by comparing ourselves with USA and China, and then we know how bad we have performed or what is actually the performance gap over here. Now, it's important to aim high. And one of these is, I have watched this video many times, is this 100 meters dash, which for the first time in Olympics, there was no need for a photo finish or a photo finish because the lead was so huge. It even allowed Hussein Blount to slow down in the last few strides. Now that is his entire country going gaga over that. And then you would have noticed that every time before he runs, he bows to the ground and then looks up and makes this gesture every time he runs which shows that he is aiming for the sky. And that is why he is still the fastest man alive. Now, after he finished the Olympics last time, they asked him, what has made it easy for you? And this is exactly from his interview. He said, easy? Imagine me. 
from nothing to the fastest person on earth. That too from Jamaica, that too are black. People look at it in the end and say it looks so easy. But before it gets to that point, there are so many sacrifices, times so difficult that you want to stop and just give up everything. But you have to go. When your body says no, you have to learn to say yes. Your body says stop running, you are tired. Go play football like others, go play golf. But you have to keep running because nothing comes without hard work. I think this is something that we really have to do. The, both the dream and the hard work is very important. When Steve Jobs was asked what, you know, he didn't dream about producing another iPhone which was just little better than Nokia. He never even dreamt about a computer or an iPhone. He just said, I just want to put a ding in the universe. And certainly he did and the rest is history. So what fuels some people to persist and keep on going? And I think this is very important to learn when you be begin your profession. I think it's passion and purpose. And like just what Mr. Milka Singh said yesterday, if you have the hard work, willpower and dedication, then even sky is not the limit. And a very good attitude at this stage is the most important thing because the altitude that you will reach is determined by your attitude. Now when everything is going on, you have the zest and you are in your mid-career stage and you have everything is going on, there are three snakes which can catch you and can slow you down or bring you down. Now one is celebrating success too early. This is very important. Early slow down when you people get confused with life work balance and unwanted distractions in life. Now celebrating success very early is one of the phenomenon that actually brings us down. This is very common in the Indian cricket team before. I mean in a test cricket match of five, if you win one, they will celebrate so much that they'll have such an abysmal performance in the next test match. If your aim is to cry up over here to the crest, then if you have a celebration at every point, you are completely distracted and your steam will go away. If you are running a long marathon, you can rest a little to take a little water, but you cannot take a dinner at every corner and certainly marathon is out of your head. The story of Watson and Craig is something which all of us should know. All of us know that Watson and Crick got the Nobel Prize for encoding the DNA. And they both were extremely young at that time. Watson was just about 32. But subsequently, nothing came, great came out of Watson. And once when he was asked after 10 years, what happened? He said, unfortunately, Nobel Prize made me a celebrity. There was so much of celebration that actually, unfortunately, nothing came out of me after that. So you have to look into your passion and forget it and you have to go back to your work every time you get an award. The other important things that can pull you down is professional fatigue. People start with high aims and objectives, but you find that at about 40 to 45, you see that they are starting to slow down. And two important reasons are there. Monotony of work, which gives you a lot of fatigue. And when you start considering that you are working for somebody else, when you are just working for your salary and your work is a service for prey. Now, monotony, you have to really fight hard against it because after a day's work, if every day you are feeling tired, then something is wrong with what you are doing. As Steve Jobs said, ask every time, when was the last time that you did something for the first time? Because that will keep a zing in your life. As Subrata Bhakshi said, Individuals and institutions need to reinvent themselves. They need to do something new. They need to give some new ideas every five years. Otherwise, they will get into something. And I would suggest that the best spice in our work is clinical research. Now, we have one of the largest back pain clinics in the country. And it can be really monotonous. It can be fatiguing when you have to see patients from morning 8 to night 8 and only back pain patients. But what makes it possible for us, and in fact makes it quite interesting for us, 
is that you have introduced research into it and then every patient looks very interesting to us. That is also that it gave us three international awards and gave us an international standing. So all of us must look when you are young how to integrate clinical research into your practice. And please do not have this early slowdown phenomenon. I frequently listen to so many people who are in their 40s, 45s, and 48, 50, 52. They say, it's time that I slow down. And I really wonder why. What has happened to them? If you, this is the problem, if this is what you are, and quickly you are becoming this, then I think you should look at some enthusiasm and some inspiration. We have so many role models right in front of us. Every one of them are there, have excelled in whatever they have done. They are from different groups, they have different backgrounds, they are working in different setups, but at this time I can say mentally they are very young compared to many, any one of us. And it is from them that we should rub off the enthusiasm from them and we should prevent an early slowdown. The last thing is that keep your main thing in life as the main thing. And this is very important. There are so many other uh, interesting things in life. Surely, exotic holidays, stock market gives you better, business investments is very good. You can become a dealer for one of the big companies. You can become a real estate agent, commodity training. Everything is very good. But this is very good if your main idea is just to earn money. That is fine. Then you can do all that. But if you are talking of professional excellence and then you are also looking at these things and getting distracted, then you can be sure that you will not be the best in your profession over a period of time. To be focused and to have singleness of purpose is very important. As Sachin said, I only think of playing good cricket, nothing else. <coughs> Let's not fool ourselves. Sachin was one of the most wealthiest cricketer. But he did not think of money. That is the most important thing. And when you don't think of money and when you think of only being the best, money automatically comes to you. He said the hunger for runs is the same today as it was when I started. With that attitude, he carried on and in this process, he carried India on his shoulders. Now, you all know the other legend, Joe. Joe had the highest history of home runs ever in softball. And when people asked, how is it that you hit a home run every time? He said, it doesn't matter to me whether it is my first match or the hundredth match because I cannot relax in any game. Money is not important. There is always some kid in the audience who may be seeing me for the first time. There is some kid who has saved money to buy the ticket to watch me play. And I owe him the best. And naturally, there is nobody who has ever beaten his record. One another thing that I have learned from personal experience is it is easy to say avoid fatigue. But you do feel tired from time to time especially when you have to work day and night and you have to work on this for many years together. And then I learned from Arvind Hospitals that you need to see the larger picture of what you are doing. Then your work becomes more interesting and everyday work is a matter of joy. I'll just give a small example. Now when this child comes to your hospital at night 10.30 and then you are gone home and you have to come back and you have to start doing this, now you can look at it in two different ways. Now at surgery starting at 11 p.m., you think of resuscitation, radical debridement, fixation of humerus, brachial artery repair, median nerve repair, and then a pedicle LD flap and cover. Now this looks terrible. This looks really very bad and drowsy. But if you see the larger picture of it and look at it in a different way, if you think at it that what you're going to do that night is giving back the right arm to a 10-year-old girl who is the age of your daughter or granddaughter, that she will be playing as the classmates as before. She can continue with her dreams in life. Family will be ever grateful to you. It takes you to the next dimension and then it makes you all pleasurable to do it. Now, this is the same girl two years later. 
and you can see that what was from an amputation stage, that one night's work of a team actually made a huge difference in a person's life. So what you look at your work, how you look at it is something that is very, very important. Just another example that this poor boy who actually came from many hundreds of miles, if you look at him as a severe spinal deformity, a patient who does not have Being any straight, money, straight. then it looks very bad. But if you look at it as a young person who is severely dyspneic even while he is mildly walking, and then if you think you are going to create a difference in his life, and then this massive surgery makes very uh, <coughs> good, and this gives you a different perspective of life. Just like Aravind Hospital, they said, what made it possible for them to be the highest eye care provider in the world was not the money, not the number of surgeries, but they just looked at the larger picture of this world should be free of preventable blindness. So our greatest gift, which is going to power us all the time, is the gift of ability to see the transformation of the nation through our work, one patient at a time. Sometimes when we talk of big ideals, we talk of big, big things, but then forget it when it comes to one patient at a time. No big achievement can be got, either for our nation or for our society or for the institution that we work or for ourselves if we do not look at it as tiny cubicles. Just like the photo has to have many pixels, our lifetime work can be done only through each patient and we have to look at it over there. Now the last thing that takes you really high up is institution building. Now when you are young, you can be too alone, but the biggest jump that is going to take you beyond others, very close to the finish race, is when you have the transformation of from one individual to an institution. The power of an institution is very huge because the power of collective wisdom the power of collective energy is something that can make impossible possible. As this Chinese proverb says, if you want to walk fast, walk alone, but then you will not be walking forever. If you want to walk far, walk together, and you must create an institution over this time. A small group of affordable people could change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. This is one of the most powerful quotations that I have ever read. Because this allows one to give the three things that is important to make a difference to the society. Your expertise must be available all the time. You cannot say, I am the best microsurgeon, I am the best spine surgeon, but I will not work from Christmas to New Year. And if you have a cut injury, it's your bad luck. Your institution must be able to provide it day and night. And that availability can be done only if you have a big uh, institution. <laughs> now let's think of this young boy who was run over by a lorry, open pelvic injury, chest injury, and a mangled extremity which is fit for amputation. You can see this here, and most of you will agree that if I say that it should be amputated, especially in the event of his having a pelvic injury and chest injury, you will all agree. But we had a team, the an anesthetic team, that would help us to reconstruct. An orthopedic team which was available to do whatever was necessary and the plastic surgery team that went on to reconstruct. And this is the same person again after 16 months. So what made it possible? It is not any particular individual. Because when we think of these things, the science that we talk in a conference or the science that we talk on the principles inside a five-star hotel or even in a lecture room, this is easy to understand. We can always know that the principles of success is resuscitation, debridement, skeletal fixation, neurovascular reconstruction and rehabilitation. But in real life, what makes it possible is the availability, affordability for a poor patients, the unit's philosophy to do its best at any time of the day, hard work, sustenance of the service throughout the year round and round and the ability to see the larger picture. And at the end, this is what is going to matter to you and also matter to the society. 
The third thing that uh, institution allows you to do is affordability to the patient. Now from 1991 to 2013, in 22 years, the institution has grown from 35 beds to 503 beds. And we are doing a huge number of surgeries, which makes us one of the largest centers in South Asia. But however, our pride comes from the fact that more than 30% of our surgeries are at a highly subsidized rate, which the rest of the country would not believe. Because cost does matter in our place. Every day, surgeons like us have an important job to do. And here I am quoting Devi Shetty. He says the most important job for us is not surgery. We are actually placing the price on the health and well-being of a fellow citizen, especially when he is not able to afford the care that he needs to be done. And if we make our services unaffordable, then it really doesn't matter you're the best guy around the world if you will not do it for the patient at a price that he is able to afford. So institutions make this possible by giving a large number. Third is reaching to the society can be done only as an institution. We are not taking pride that we are the largest spine unit in the country, but because it gives us the power to help people who really most. Two years before we started the rehabilitation service for the spinal cord injury, where we not only rehabilitated them, but also put them on to a vocational service. And it is also possible for us that we go up to the level that where these people are rehabilitated back into their society, into their home place, into what they do. And it is a means that he can be got back to independence in his home, in his home place. Now, you can see with these very simply small adaptations of the wheelchair, that even in a village which doesn't have any good uh, roads, where there is no pavement, where there are lots of stones, that these patients are able to do. And we don't take pride in more than the 2,500 surgeries that we do, but this is something that what gives us uh, soul satisfying over here. Our plastic surgery condom rays have gone still further and they have started a project of hope after fire. This is the 12th biggest social service project that was done by our hospital. And what did it achieve? This patient who had a burns when he was young has never worn a shirt because his arm is stuck to his side of the chest and his hand is gone up to the dorsum. And you can see that they have done a completely free surgery for him, which has gone and taken back over here. Similarly, children who are completely burned have been brought back to normal life by these people. So it is this that allows you a satisfaction. And this is this that gives you the power to keep going when your day-to-day -day work is really pulling you down. Our Honorable Justice Shivraj Patil, who was here yesterday and who is a, a co-collaborator with us on our PAL, actually when he visited our hospital, he said, you should concentrate on this more because rich people pay and poor people pray for you and this is what will help you in times of need. 20 years since we started the unit, we are not only thought of advancing our techniques, but every stage we also thought of how will this service be available to the rest of the society. Because our mission is also to bring our expertise so that it is affordable to the nation. And these have been our best ladders build up, pull up. The last ladder in life is striving for leadership because this is something that is going to take you really near to the top. Now, why should we have leadership? Now, leadership gives you many qualities that are very important for sustenance of excellence. Now, we all know the story of Kennedy who brought in the concept that USA must land on moon. And this is the most famous speech which has been seen many times over there. Can I have the audio, please? They may well ask, why climb the highest mountain? Little more, please. Five, 35 years ago, fly the Atlantic. Why does Rice play Texas? We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things. 
not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. Because that challenge is one that we're willing to accept, one we are unwilling to postpone, and one we intend to win, and the others too. Now, if you go to the YouTube, you will see that this is one of the most watched videos because it had many things into it other than just landing on the moon. Landing on the moon and the common name united USA like anything. It gave them a prestige, a purpose for which they all were united. Because it makes you do the things that you are capable of doing and it brings the best out of you. Because that goal of leadership will serve to organize measure and develop the best of your energies and skill. And that is what is going to help you to win on that particular challenges and the other challenges that come to. Secondly, you can't be easily a leader. And leadership is very temporary. So if you want to be a leader for a long time, it makes you work continuously. It is not a one-time job where you go up the Mount Everest and climb down the next day. If you have to stop there, then it is a continuous job. As Bill Gates said, leadership is not a permanent entitlement. It will have to be that you have to work hard continuously for that. Because in any field, the period of leadership is getting shorter and shorter. History shows that the leader of a field in one generation is never the leader of that field in the next generation. He said, I am afraid of history. I want to beat history, which means that he was willing to work very hard to just be on the field for some more time. And if you want to be the leader of orthopedics, or if your institution wants to be the best, then there needs to be a continuous improvement and continuous refinement of your skills, which is the most important thing. So I have been talking about a lot of ladders, and let us talk of one last snake before we go. Now with a lot of leadership, hard work, willpower, dedication, we have come here. And there is only one small step from here to here, and there is one big snake waiting there, and that can bring you right down. Now, we all should have a very clear concept of money when you are just starting your profession. Money is very important. As one of the persons in this audience who perhaps has the highest number of loan on my head, I really know the value of money. I also know the value of every paisa. But money should come through professional excellence as a byproduct of your service and not at the expense of it. Because leaders have come crashing down when they have opted for money, not in the right possible way. So can I get this back? So it is a problem. Yeah. So we also have many other examples where at the peak of excellence, where people are praising you, you just make one small mistake and then you become a point of laughing stock to others. So we also have many instances of professional excellence over here. Now I have spoken to many of the young people there are approximately around 120 young doctors who come for training to our institution in both departments. And many have talked to me about this, and they always say, Sir, if we don't do this surgery, somebody else is going to do it. If I don't get this commission, somebody is going to do it. If I don't give this kickback, somebody else is going to give back. Now, this was the same argument of Adolf Eichmann during his trial for the Nazis in the trial of Jerusalem. He said, if I wouldn't have done it, somebody else would have surely done it. Would you all accept that? In fact, he was hanged on the 31st of March. And we may not be sure that fate may have the same purpose for us. So in conclusion, this brings us to the question, is our life just a snake and ladders game? And if it is so, who is playing our dice? I mean, are we playing our dice or the snakes will catch you if our fate is led to? 
Are we just a puppet in life's game of fate? Now actually look, just look what scriptures tell us. The law of karma is neither fatalistic or punitive, nor is man a hapless, helpless victim in its bonds. God has blessed each one of us with reason, intellect and discrimination, as well as the sovereign of free will. And we cannot blame fate for doing the wrong things in life. And this is from Vedas itself. It is not just the Eastern thought, but even Einstein, the biggest scientist in the world, he said, karma is the destiny man weaves for himself. And his famous quotation is, God does not play dice with the universe. Most of it is very well chosen. As you begin your life, plan your life. You can either keep your life like this, very simple, with a few ladders and a few snakes, or you can keep it very complicated like this, where you are playing dangerously with so many vices and so many snakes in your life. So you have to plan your life, your goals and your attainment. It's so important to get on the right track because if your train is on the wrong track, every station, every achievement you do will come to the wrong station. Love the job you do because then you don't have stress. You won't be burnt down. As Confucius said, choose a job that you love passionately and then you will never have to work for another day in your life. Have big goals. There is no more benumbering error than to mistake a stage for a goal or to linger it too long in the resting place. And if you have a too low a goal and you achieve it, that is not as important as having a very high goal and not achieving it. Don't ever settle for the second best. Give up the chalta high attitude. We always clap when Sachin talks about it, when Milka Singh talks about it. We have to get out of this auditorium as young citizens of India and erase this chalta high attitude because the world does not have a record for second best performance. Contentment in life is good, but contentment in profession is not good. You have to look at not what you do, but also look at it as the denominator what needs to be done. If you are doing hundred or thousands of club foot or spine surgeries, if the society knee meets many thousands more, still our fraction becomes much less. To the end of the profession, keep the principle that the best interest of the patient is the only interest that needs to be considered. Now this was easy many years ago, but now there are so many other players in our practice. And in fact, the patient's interest is shrinking. The doctor also is shrinking. The hospital and the industry and the insurance becomes big and the patient's interest is going down at all. In all this problem, keep equanimity of mind and keep your soul in peace. Because if you are not a happy person in heart, then you cannot perform better. One of the things that makes you bitter is comparing yourself, your wealth, your earnings with others, and this is going to be better. Don't do that. And if you have a doubt whether life is being fair to you, be sure that the universe unfolds only as it should. If you think you are getting less, then probably that is what the universe thinks. If you are thinking you are getting more, then that is what you see. Now we all have to think of this, this is one of my favorite songs, to keep your mind open because that is very important to me. Can I have the audience uh, audio please? Now you only see what your eyes want to see. How can life be what you want it to be? You are frozen when your heart is not... Do you see what your eyes want to see? How can life be what you want it to be? You're so consumed with how much you get You waste your time with hate and regret You're broken when your heart's not open So I think it's very important that we don't play with money and we don't let money spoil our dreams of excellence. Last slide is that Alexander, when he was before dying, they asked him, what is your last wish? He said, bury me with my hands outside so that let the world know that the man who won the world has nothing in his hand in the end. Now, let us get the squires of virtue in our general life and the squires of virtue. 
in our professional game. And if we make them the ladders, and if we get our lifeboats and support, then we will achieve the lots. And I think we should all learn to accept God's plans. And I thank God for putting more ladders in my life than snakes and for giving us the correct wisdom to do it. Let me thank my parents. Now is the era when parents say, I see so many of my younger colleagues, they say, I don't want to be a parent, I want to be a friend to my child. Child also questions everything that the parent says. But when we were young, we just did what our parents told us to do. And we believed that they told us was the right thing. I thank them for telling us all the right things. We had the best of our teachers. And from them, we learned not only orthopedics, but many things in life itself. When I was a student, I always used to wonder why every orthopedic textbook, every author put his wife's name in front of it. But when you get gray hairs, when you become 55, you know the power of the wife and the power of the children because they have to give you happiness. Otherwise, you cannot concentrate on them. I thank them for providing the work-home balance in life, even when we were heavily unbalanced in our work-home relationship. And lastly, the Ganga team. I mean, this has been a dream team. Any one of us can have a vision. But to turn that vision into action, you need people who have willingly sacrificed their smaller dreams for a big, shared one. Many of us have got tired, but the, we have been able to pass the baton to others. And while they carried on, we were able to rejuvenate and come back to over here. Lastly, I would not be standing here if all of you had not elected me, shown your faith to elect me as the president for 2012. I thank one and all of you for this honor and privilege, and it has been a great privilege in life, a true honor to be the president in 2012 and to deliver this lecture in 2013. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Dr. Well, thanks a lot, sir. A talk worth of a past president of IUA, and now we have the honor of giving you this medal. I have the pleasant duty of inviting our present president, Dr. Sanjeev Maria, to give his talk and a few words about him. He has about uh, 30 years of orthopedic experience. He did his MBBS from Rohtak and MS from PGI Chandigarh, where he was declared the best postgraduate of that year. He has conducted more than 12,000 joint replacement surgeries. He has a passion for teaching and he has been invited to several places. He has demonstrated live surgeries in nine countries and delivered lectures in 21 nations. He has been invited to deliver 14 orations by various bodies. He has